Good morning. It, today is Wednesday, January 18th, 2023. This is the second uh, session of the Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee. And we are meeting this morning with um, Professor John Erickson from the University of Vermont. We're going to make a pitch. Um, I've been reading in the last <laughs> several weeks his brand new book, The Progress Illusion, Reclaiming Our Future from the Fairy Tale of Economics. And um, so it's a great read, beautifully written. Thank you. A lot of data, a lot of great stories, artfully expressed. Who could ask for more? <laughs> um, uh, no, I seriously, I highly recommend it to people. And the reason I um, spoke with Professor Erickson before and asked him to come in, as we frame up our work on the Affordable Heat Act, um, we're talking about trying to um, modify the economics around heating in Vermont. And so uh, part of the reason we're in the predicament we're in is that we live in an economic paradigm that doesn't value treating people equally and doesn't value treating the environment with uh, respect, as I'm saying. Uh, we externalize costs all the time to our detriment. So that, that was the thing I was pondering, and then I read Professor Erickson's book, which we chatted over the years many times, and I thought it would be a great opportunity for us as we really dig into this bill to ground ourselves in an economic perspective that I think will help us make sense of the bill. So that's my great. But the floor is yours. We have an hour and a half, so there's I no I saw rush. that. Wow. It's, just, it's such an honor to have so much time. Thank you. Well, we're delighted that you were willing to give us time. Wow. And um, before we get started, I would also like to make sure that we all know each other here at the table. So let's go around the table, starting with Senator White. Hi, I'm Rebecca White, and I am fortunate to be in the Windsor County District. OK, thank you. I'm Mark McDonald, Orange County. We're Spray Addison County. Ann Watson, the Washington District. I'm Dick McCormick, and I represent Winch County with uh, Senator White. <laughs> she already stole your thunder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. She often does. So, floor is yours. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's really uh, an honor always to come to, to both Senate and the House. Um, so, yeah, we're talking today about the Affordable Heat Act. <laughs> so I, I prepared some notes. Maybe I can offer you some initial thoughts for 20 minutes or so, and then I'd love to leave lots of time for discussion. Okay. Um, so um, I've been working on energy and climate economics and policy for three decades. So as I was reflecting on this last night, I was thinking, oh my god, I feel like Bill Murray and Groundhog Day, like <laughs> every year coming into uh, the Senate and the House and, and talking about these themes um, and seeing some progress, but certainly by no means uh, fast enough or far enough. So while I'm thrilled that this bill is being taken up, I, I do look at it um, with a critical eye of, sure. you know, what are we doing and how, how can we make it better? Um, I had asked you to look at the bill critically. You did. Not just hear the <laughs> buckets of, uh, you know, the great job you've done. Yeah, and I know you spent a lot of time on a similar bill last year. So I also don't want to just repeat things that you've already heard. Um, I think you've all heard much of the framing and the arguments and the need for something like a clean heat standard or an affordable heat act. Um, so. I thought that I'd, I'd frame my discussion first and foremost about our economy's path dependence. <laughs> our economy is, is hooked on fossil fuels and, and really what it's going to take to break what we sometimes call carbon lock-in um, and how this bill could help our, our state in particular break free from a really, in, in my view, Again, 30 years of working on this, a debilitating fossil fuel dependence that is limiting our state's economy, unfairly burdening our low and moderate income households, and polluting our local and global environment. So um, lock, lock in is something I've given a lot of thought about because it's easy to describe why lock in exists. It's really difficult to describe how to break the lock in. 
Um, so carbon lock-in occurs when fossil fuel intensive systems, which we have here in the state of Vermont, much like the rest of the US and the world indeed, that is still on 85% fossil fuels for all global energy supplies. I always like to remind people of that. This is a heavy lift. Uh, how fossil fuel intensive systems perpetuate, delay, and or prevent the transition to low carbon alternatives. Um, and, and I think that's the key. When I look at a bill like this, I'm, I'm always in that mindset. How do we break this dependence? How do we get beyond the perpetuate delay and prevention of the transition to low income alternatives? Again, thinking like Groundhog Day, like we've been here before, year, year in and year out. Um, study after study after study, happy to provide you with some sources, shows that existing energy infrastructure, existing energy infrastructure already jeopardizes international climate goals. Right, so we're, we're in a situation where we need to be retiring existing energy, carbon intensive energy infrastructure, not adding more of it. Um, study after study after study shows that the predominant fossil fuel infrastructure is inefficient, it's costly, it's subject to wild price swings, as we know in particular this last year. It's dependent on a global supply chain, and that global supply chain, all you gotta do is turn on the news and you'll see that it's entangled with the politics and atrocities of the geopolitical system that is tied to oil. Um, so, yet this fossil fuel intensive system persists. So despite people like me doing three decades of research, <laughs> it persists. In Vermont, specifically, to the thermal heat sector, what we're talking about today, carbon lock-in comes in many forms. There's capital expenditures, right? From trucks to pipelines to building infrastructure. In households and businesses, lock-in starts in the basement very often, right? With the oil or fossil gas furnace, hot water heater, plus all the inefficiencies through the years of building construction that kind of keeps us stuck on carbon. Um, that's the very well-known lock-in. You know, when you buy a new system that uses fossil fuels, you're often committing to 20, 25, 30 years on that system um, before you get off of it. And that, that's a really important context to keep in mind. Um, there's a kind of lock-in that comes from Rent seeking, what we call rent in, in economics, right? Often comes from concentrated in industries or monopoly industries or oligopoly industries like the fossil fuel industry that spend a lot of money to keep their profits, right? To keep us on fossil fuels. So the oil and gas industry concentration and control has created what we call energy burdens, has created the dependencies of low and moderate income Vermonters on fuel for heating, fossil fuels for heating. And um, the most profitable industry, I would say in history, um, has the funding to keep this going, to perpetuate this dependence. Um, and this has been some of the hang up in our own state. Um, the framing of a bill like this, um, to sort of frame it as, you know, this hurts instead of helps low income and moderate income Vermonters um, as part of that kind of rent seeking behavior that comes from the fossil fuel lobby. Um, lock in comes from capital ownership characteristics, right, which in, in a fossil fuel economy are highly concentrated. Um, in a fossil fuel economy, go to the, to the capitalist class that holds assets like rental apartments <laughs> and has no incentive to reduce fossil fuel dependence if the renter is paying the energy bill. And that's a, that's a major challenge in a, in a place like Vermont. Um, so misaligned incentive structures, I think about in terms of fossil fuel lock-in or carbon lock-in. There's many other forms. Lock-in from workforce experience and resistance to the uncertainty of new, anyone who's tried to get a contractor and try to shift them from a fossil fuel system to, a, for example, electric heat pump. Uh, is, is challenging because there's a there's a worriedness of, of newness and a lack of training and experience. And there's lock-in from culture. Culture, like certainly my generation, raised on 
fossil fuels. Ray is not a model. It's user where Senator Bray that externalizes costs, right? It doesn't keep those costs here. It's like that's the cost of the system largely, especially in Vermont. We're not a fossil fuel state. Are born on other people and on the future. Um, so you all know this. Lock-in persists, though, because of, in economics, we call it increasing returns to scale, right? There are scale economies. The bigger you get, the cheaper the system becomes. And this is a huge part of the fossil fuel industry. There are learning economies. The more experience you have with something, right, the more locked in you get to it. Uh, this is a big part of scale economies. Uh, there are network economies. The more that your system is connected to the information of other systems, Right, the more tied you become to it. And a lot of that has to do with our workforce in, in a place like Vermont. So um, lock-in persists because of state and federal subsidies. Um, tax dollars are given to oil and gas companies through the pocketbooks of low-income Vermonters, right? So this is something to really, really keep in mind. Um, every winter, right, we see these price spikes, we see Low-income Vermonters really struggling to continue to heat their homes with oil and, and gas. And we get federal dollars to offset that cost, which is a pass-through to the most profitable industry on the planet. So that's also a kind of um, frustrating part of lock-in. And then there's ongoing regulatory capture of decision makers by the fossil fuel industry, uh, industrial agriculture, international supply chains, and all the beneficiaries of the status quo. So when I think of this as an economist, I think about who benefits from the status quo and who pays the costs, okay? I don't see low income and moderate Vermonters benefiting from the status quo. I see them and their children and their grand grandchildren paying the costs, largely on influences outside of the control of Vermont. So again, anything that has to do with climate change legislation or affordable heat or electrification of our energy systems is about bringing the benefits and costs of those systems to our own state. So how do we break free from this lock-in? Well, here, here's some of the, a bit of the critique of the bill. Um, there's some immediate things that um, other states and, and, and municipalities around the world are thinking of, and that's to avoid any and all new carbon infrastructure investments. I already mentioned that, you know, once you buy a new carbon system, you're locked in for the foreseeable future. So there is this idea of retiring current, but also avoiding new, including so-called renewable natural gas, green hydrogen, and other very, very small sources of liquid fuels that reinforce the current system and at best avoid some greenhouse gas emissions from existing landfills and dairy farms and at worst, kick the can down the road of the necessary reforms in our industrial systems. Um, this is a big challenge. The bill, as you know, follows a kind of cap and trade logic, but the task of hitting a declining cap over time becomes more and more and more difficult if we're also continuing to put new carbon assets in place, right? New carbon assets that through this declining carbon intensity calculation in the bill, we have to retire in the foreseeable future that are gonna become more and more difficult to retire as we become locked into these new assets. So these new assets occur alongside the relatively low hanging fruit of efficiency improvements and, and retirement of existing sources. So I want you to kind of keep that in mind as I go through this. The immediate task is to really avoid any and all new carbon infrastructure investments. Short term, that's immediate. Short term, efficiency of existing assets, particularly through weatherization, avoided fuel costs, right? And avoiding new capital costs. Like we shouldn't be um, switching to, for example, electric heat pumps in very inefficient homes. That makes no sense, <laughs> right? There's lots of chicken and eggs here. You know, we really, I mean, the, the whole idea of net zero ready is that you make your home in this situation your transportation system, your heating system, your electric system, as efficient as possible before you do the conversion or as you do the conversion. So I'm always looking for ways of like, is this comprehensive enough? Are we really thinking of the full kind of system perspective of the energy system 
and are we aligning things with efficiency improvements? Um, medium term, retirement of existing carbon infrastructure. Um, I think this goes without saying, but again, I make the point that um, if we're retiring existing infrastructure while adding new infrastructure, we're making our lives more difficult down, down the road. So I do see these kind of heat credits as different beasts in the sense of how do they offset existing infrastructure versus how, how are they offsetting the addition of new infrastructure. Long term, there should be no long term, right? There really should be no long term. We're out of time. Um, we're already late to the party. So allowing liquid and gas fuels to artificially extend the carbon infrastructure, I think, really needs a second look. And this is where I see some improvements between the bill this year and last year's version, right? So you really sort of take seriously um, the kind of lock-in to, to liquid and gas fuels in general. So this bill does address some of the low-hanging fruit of efficiency, weatherization, electrification of thermal loads, but it does still, brand better than last year, punt on biofuels and thermal energy efficiency improvements, um, sacrificing some, some lock-in, especially to expanding fossil gas industry, and by further encouraging things like industrial farming systems, further stretching out-of-state supply dependencies, further financing out-of-state economic development by sort of staying stuck into the current energy system. Um, so this is the context of carbon lock-in, and now I just, I just want to provide a few more specific comments on some key features of this bill, particularly changes since last session's version and potential areas for improvement. Any, any questions on just the framing, or should I dive into a couple of the more specifics? Good. Okay, good. So three, three, three points I'd like to make. One is around affordability, one around carbon intensity, and one around economic development. Okay, The economic development piece is kind of implied in the bill, but I think in the, the framing of this bill, that's a huge <laughs> piece, right? The economy of the future, not the economy of the past, is how I see this bill as being framed. So first, affordability. Um, this is the right focus. This is the obvious focus. I, I know you all are going to get heat for, oh, you just renamed it. It's the same bill as last year. I've already seen some of the op-eds. But this is about centering equity and centering affordability, right? Uh, a fossil fuel future is not affordable. I mean, let's just start there, OK? It's dependent on outside forces. It's dependent on highly variable fuel costs, right? It exports the rents of fossil fuels outside of Vermont. It's a losing bargain for a state for a non-fossil fuel economy like the state of Vermont. You all know this. Um, affordability focuses on energy burdens, and that's the right focus, right? We've seen the studies. Vermont Law School has a great study out. Um, Efficiency Vermont, I think, did two versions of a study on energy burdens where we're trying to understand the percent of household income that is spent on energy services. Um, so this is that kind of lock-in that we see, particularly amongst our low and moderate income neighbors. Um, it's, this energy burden is highest among low-income Vermonters. It's highest among rural households in old housing stock. It's higher amongst the renting class throughout the, throughout the state of Vermont. It's especially acute because of the aging building stock in Vermont and the above average, I said state, but in New England, on fuel oil dependence. Um, so this is where I get that kind of Bill Murray <laughs> Groundhog Day moment, right? It's like, how many more winners <laughs> do we need to go through talking about high fuel oil prices, potential supply restrictions, further subsidies to the most profitable industry in human history? Um, how do we break that path dependence? Can I jump in? Yeah, you? please. So one of our challenges, I mean, we're, we're starting with due diligence on trying to really analyze what's going on, how this bill would interact with current systems, and what the consequences of it would be. Right? You know, that nothing holds with the whole thing. Yes. There's also um, kind of a, uh, a puzzling thing that goes on. As we look at a system that's currently not affordable for people, and, you know, I was saying to you that I've been informally chatting with people over the last year about, well, how, how's it going with buying, uh, keeping your house warm, more, 
you know, and people are saying, well, it's two to four thousand dollars more than two winters ago right. before this price spike hit. Um, and yet, when we talk about this work, we are regularly uh, challenged around the notion of we're not actually going to help on affordability. We're actually going to make it worse. So I'm, you know, puzzling over how do we accurately speak about the affordability of the current system versus what we're aiming for. And I'm not sure why it's so hard yeah. to get the message out that what we're proposing uh, is a genuine move towards greater affordability. Well, that's why the comprehensive approach is really important, important and it's implicit in this bill, right? If you're home and you're stuck on oil for your heat and you don't change anything, <laughs> you don't weatherize, you don't take advantage of state programs, you don't take advantage of uh, incentives to finance on, fill, on, on bill financing, right? And you just stay on oil for the foreseeable future, right? With or without this bill, <laughs> you're on an unaffordable path, right? Because the future of oil is anyone's guess, um, and it's always it's always that way. Price could go low, price could go high. Prices right now depend on you know wars in distant places. Um, so, affordability is. If, and if I continue with some of my points, because this is exactly the point I want to make. Like, why do we hang on to the notion that fossil fuels, by any stretch of the imagination, is a, an affordable energy pathway? You guys make that distinction between a pathway and the current system, and I think that's also important in terms of framing up this legislation, right? We're talking about instituting a pathway to get off fossil fuels. Households that decide to stay on fossil fuels, with or without this bill, that's an expensive pathway. That's an unpredictable pathway. That's an unreliable pathway, right? When folks all around them, especially outside the United States, are already off, off that bandwagon altogether. Um, one point I want to make about fuel oil, and this relates to what you're saying, Senator Bray. I'm not sure this is widely known, but we, we think of a barrel of oil. There are multiple products that come from a barrel of oil. Okay, When we refine a barrel of oil, it's like a recipe. Okay, The biggest thing we get is gasoline. The second biggest thing we get is fuel oil. As long as the fossil fuel industry still has a good market for gasoline, which they do in the foreseeable future, and a shrinking market for fuel oil, which they do in most of the rest of the country, they need new fuel oil customers to get rid of a product that they can't do anything else with, right? Fuel oil comes from a barrel of oil, as does kerosene, as does jet fuel, as does all those higher value products, right? So the fossil fuel industry needs states like Vermont in order to sell fuel oil. Right, that's really an important aspect. It's a big chunk of what comes out of the refining frame process. Um, so there is a relationship to transportation here. Um, so my point: How can anyone argue that a fossil fuel future is an affordable future? Affordable heat must mean reducing thermal energy demand through weatherization, improving heating efficiency, electrifying loads to a decarbonizing grid. That's the key, right? We don't electrify load to a carbonizing grid. <laughs> we electri electrify loads to a decarbonizing grid. Um, affordable heat is perfectly aligned with our state's greenhouse gas goals. Um, so uh, this fits hand in glove with the Global Warming Solutions Act. Uh, affordable heat keeps more money in state. Okay, and this is where some of the nuance of affordability comes. If you can recycle more of that money in state, you're helping our tax base, you're helping our job base, right? You're helping all of these things that are a little more challenging to measure that when folks like the consultants who worked for the Agency of Natural Resources last year built an economic model for the state looking at low carbon options, they're trying to capture all those multiplier effects, what we call multiplier effects in economics. Um, Affordable heat builds our future economies, workforce, climate resilience, okay? And, and this is where I understand that in a bill, you're trying to create some flexibility knowing that you don't have a lot of time, right? Knowing that you have targets to hit in the Global Warming Solutions Act, right? But some of that flexibility is built in because of current workforce, workforce bottlenecks, right? So, so there's some chicken and eggs that are going on here that we have to be cognizant of. Uh, and most immediately, affordable heat capitalizes on 
and I can't stress this enough, new monies from the Inflation Reduction Act, right? There is a huge opportunity here. Um, understanding the need for flexibility, it is frustrating to see kind of a you know three-year ramp-up phase, but I am excited to see that the, the work starts right away. Like, I think this month, right? <laughs> like if this bill is passed into law, the kind of credits that can be accumulated start now. So it's not like we're waiting for the PUC and these other government agencies to get their ducks in a row. Um, this is an important aspect of, of the current bill. Um, but our state has a habit of leaving federal dollars on the table. I hope we don't do that with the millions of dollars coming through the Inflation Reduction Act. I don't want to be in this committee. I'm sorry, but you all seem like nice folks, but I don't want to be here two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, saying why is the Vermont legislature continuing to steer through the rear view mirror, right? Um, and as, as disappointed as I was to see this not be passed into law next year, I'm, I am encouraged that we're taking a second chance. Again, I, I can point to the literature. There are many studies to cite about economic equity, environmental benefits of this transition to affordable clean heat. You say that again, economic, the affordability piece, equity, particularly the focus on this bill on putting low income households, modern income households first in line, and environmental benefits, of course, because the framing of this is contributing to the Global Warming Solutions Act. Um, you don't need to look any further than the Vermont Pathways Analysis Report 2.0, which I think was delivered early, early in the session last year prepared by consultants for the current administration, for the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources, that shows savings over the time frame of this legislation in the billions, with a B, okay? Net savings cost so much to implement, especially the new infrastructure improvements, the savings that you get back, and just, just in terms of energy savings, not even counting the externalities, the avoided, the avoided external costs of the current system. And again, in the, in the state government study, much of that directed at low and moderate income households. So um, this framing, Senator Bray, of unaffordability is just, <laughs> I don't know what it is, it's brownwashing, I guess is the, it's the word for it, right? Because <laughs> it's not even greenwashing. Um, weatherization alone, I'll just stress this again, the chicken and egg things here is a gold mine for household savings. Um, again, you just look at our own state government work. The Vermont Department of Health found that a 10-year economic benefit of weatherization in both energy and health costs, sometimes we forget the health costs of weatherized homes, comfortable homes, well-heated homes, well-ventilated homes, is nearly three times greater than the initial expense. Okay, three to one cost-benefit ratio on, on weatherization programs. Combine that with the fact that we're getting weatherization dollars from the federal government, I mean, it's just, this is an investment in the future economy of Vermont, right? I mean, this is, this is an unparalleled opportunity and it all comes down to breaking this lock-in that I've been discussing. Okay, second point, carbon intensity and third point, economic development. Unless it, dive in anytime, please. I don't, teach at UVM, I'm used to getting interrupted. <laughs> oh, uh, so cost benefit of health savings being three to one. Yeah. Uh, On average, yeah. Yeah, so that, uh, I just want to make sure I understand that. So uh, you would save three times as much as your, as your expense. You, you get back in terms of benefits, in terms yeah. of energy savings, mm -hmm. healthcare cost savings, so again, not even getting into the fuzzy math around externalities like the social cost of carbon. If you start adding that in, then you get five, 10, 20 to one ratios, right? Um, but just just those costs that are incurred by the household, right? The Vermont Department of Health find, found a three, three to one ratio. Um, and, and that report talks about what's the average cost of weatherizing homes and what, what are the, benefits and dollars that come from energy savings and health healthcare cost savings. Yeah. And there's a huge literature on those healthcare cost savings, on the, the costs uh, of, of our most vulnerable communities in particular. Um, 
I mean, you all know what it feels like to perhaps be in a drafty, unventilated, crappy space, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's not so good on the physical and mental health. Uh, and that's a big that's a big part about this. We're not doing Vermonters any favors by keeping folks on fossil fuels to heat the outdoors, <laughs> um, right through drafty homes. And so this is specifically for weatherization. This this that Vermont okay. Department of Health study was specifically for weatherization. Yep, yep. Because we've got past legislation that set weatherization targets yeah. by year with goals, and we haven't met them. Right. So part of this bill, I think, is trying to ramp up on, on goals that are already in place for the state of Vermont. Again, Groundhog Day, you, you all are great at setting goals. <laughs> where I see, always see the challenges, where, where are the standards, where are the accountability? Now and, the requirements. And now I see requirements, which is a, a night and day, night and day. Um, there's really interesting health-related work along the same lines in Central Vermont Hospital, where they there were people who were coming back in, who I think, with pulmonary issues repeatedly, right. and they ended up prescribing a weatherization for the home, and it turned out to be cost-effective to go do a uh, deep retrofit on the home, yep. the weatherization, improving indoor air quality. And it just delivered pure health savings right off the bat. And so they've written scripts for weatherization. <laughs> and Absolutely. One of the things I'm hoping we can do over time is get a Medicare Medicaid waiver that will allow that kind of script to become a normal right. procedure. Yeah, these are all those uncounted benefits that we often ignore. Um, I mean, I've got firsthand experience with this. My brother and his family just moved here from Colorado. Climate refugee, tired of the wildfires, spent all last summer, he couldn't go outdoors with his kids because his eyes would tear up and couldn't breathe. <laughs> Said, we're moving back east. And of course, had a really hard time finding an affordable home, <laughs> but found a rundown old house in Lincoln, Vermont, right? That desperately needed weatherization and everything else. So we got the contractors in line, got everything in place, took a few months, but before the winter hit, he had a weatherized home. He had a wood stove put in. Uh, he's still on an oil burner, so that's his next step, right? But first do the weatherization, then sort of tackle, get off the oil piece. Um, and I can, I, I, it's just extraordinary to me to walk in his house and see the before and after, right? And the all the weatherization work was put into an affordable monthly payment, right? That is equivalent what you say. To all the savings, exactly, exactly. So the financial arguments have been there. The motivational, cultural arguments are really, are really the hard part to get over. The answer to what I'm going to ask, you've all was embedded in what you've already said. Yes, please. But I'd like to sort of just frame it. We hear angry emails, and <laughs> angry confrontations from constituents. Yes. We read letters to the editor and editorials. Uh, I know how I answer this. I'm just curious how you answer the argument. Everything would be fine if we just had energy independence, mm. if we did not stop the pipeline, if we drill baby drill, if we just have more petroleum. Right. Okay. And you environmentalists just you care about your agenda you don't care about working people <laughs> okay with your environmentalists sure sure just how do how do you address that because the, there, there is a, a culture war class warfare argument that's made and it's totally bogus but getting at it yep is hard well the right in the sense that vermonters benefit from a fossil fuel industry that imposes costs on other people in other places, right? So um, if you're in 
North or South Dakota, if you're in Wyoming, if you're in Oklahoma, you're in Texas, right? And you're building your whole economy on a non-renewable resource and it's depleting that faster than we've ever depleted these resources in the past. Going back to old retired wells and fracking them with chemicals, right? Squeezing every last little piece of oil out of shell rock in Canada, uh, building new pipelines, right? This is all to keep the fossil fuel industry in place. It's all short-termism. Take climate change off, off the table, right? So if they, if, if they don't want to say, you know, this is our responsibility, our share of the problem, we, need, we all need to contribute, so we can make those arguments quite literally until the cows come home in Vermont, right? And they often don't go anywhere. Um, but staying on fossil fuels, an industry, we'll never have a fossil fuel industry in Vermont because our geology says so, right? We'll, we'll always be at the end of the tailpipe of the U.S. and global fossil fuel industry, right? Getting the scraps. I mean, we were one of the last states to get, you know, on the natural gas bandwagon. And by the time we were saying it's a transition fuel, every other state was like, transition's been over for a while now, right? We're trying to get off this, not add new pipelines. Um, I mean, we could go into the geology of fossil fuel and what's left and what's peaking, right? The fact that an oil well back in the good old days of the 40s and 50s would last 15, 20 years. An oil well today lasts on the order of four to five months. That's how fast we're depleting what's left. Um, if you take oil depletion curves and stack them on each other, right? We used to get this much oil from one well, now we get this much oil from a thousand wells, right? So this is the kind of math that I think the average Vermonter doesn't appreciate. Yes. This is the kind of math that uh, is really hard to understand if you just want to go to the pump and fill up, if you just want to pay for your oil for the winter, right? If you just don't want to think about the energy system. But I don't know any Vermonter Correct me if I'm wrong, that wakes up in the morning and goes, I can't wait to pay my energy bill, right? I can't wait to write that big fat check to, the, to my local oil supplier, right? Um, all of this makes sense for economic reasons. We don't have to get into the environmental reasons. All of this makes sense for economic reasons in terms of savings, in terms of control, right? The Affordable Heat Act is part of a trend towards decentralizing our energy supply, our energy system, and creating more control and, and more capital ownership of a Vermont energy system, right? Versus just exporting our energy dollars from the state to make a very concentrated industry more wealthy than it already is. I, I was tempted to sort of bring in studies of inflation because that's on everyone's mind, right? And the fact that 60, 65% of inflation can be attributed to profits, incre increasing profits, not maintaining, increasing profits. Yet again, you turn on the news and everything, left media, right media, is pointing to higher wage rates as the source of profits, right? So there's so much framing that goes on um, to keep us locked into fossil fuels that I think the average citizen in Vermont is, is being duped. I don't know how else to put it. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Chairman Bray. Uh, I would love your perspective on something that comes up very frequently with younger constituents, which is, uh, what is the acronym? You know, I'm um, no. uh, Yes, exactly. No? <laughs> Which is, I'm. I'll be gone, you'll be gone. Oh, yeah, this geez. is, we're, yeah. we're beyond the point. Mm. And yeah. um, I think that that's the one that strikes me the hardest, is because it's, it's difficult, I think, for folks who are considering the future of our home here in Vermont right. and already starting to make space for adaption and not sure, sure. Um, prevention. So I'm wondering if you could tell us kind of the answer to two questions, which is one, how do you answer that question when people, I mean, as a professor, you probably deal yeah, with that constantly the and the hopelessness yeah. that comes with that. And then second, um, there are conflicting international reports that tell us that we have actually gone past the point or we're so close to it that it feels like we actually won't meet those requirements or those goals in other places. Like it, uh, I'm thinking of um, like this, the idea that in seven years we're going to hit our point, and that's right. 
where we've gone too far. So I'm wondering. We've been saying seven years for seven years. Yeah. So that's. <laughs> I'd love to understand the answer to those two questions. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's challenging. I mean, it is debilitating, right? To 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 to, to kind of buy into this idea that again often comes from the framing of it's too late so why, why bother right why make the framing is often tied with why make sacrifices yes. when it's already too late we'll flip that on its head what is the sacrifice like what is the sacrifice of transforming our energy system to have more control locally more jobs in our communities right more benefits, tax benefits and otherwise, of the energy system that is homegrown in Vermont. I think of this in terms of the movement for healthy watersheds, hmm. the movement for healthy food sheds, and now the movement for healthy energy sheds, right? This is ultimately, ultimately about relocalizing our energy system to capture the benefits, right? To capture the economic benefits of a new labor force, of a new job force. Um, my students at the University of Vermont are going into energy jobs, mm -hmm. are going into renewable energy sector, right? Uh, students at Vermont Tech in particular, one of the most popular, fastest growing majors there is around weatherization and solar installers. And there's a, there's a lag, but that job force, is, that workforce is coming online, right? Um, this, this kind of move towards relocalization I think a lot of our young people saw this for the first time in their lives with the pandemic, right? As we were forced to stay at home, to stay in community, of to reconnect with neighbors, of realizing that quality of life doesn't stem just from, this is a big theme in my book, doesn't stem just from consumption, mm -hmm. right? But from relationships. Um, I hate to be a geek about this, but this is about creating a relationship with your energy system. Right now, I, I don't have you know I don't have much of a relationship with my energy system, right? Pay my bill, fill up my car, right? Don't think about it. So this is about creating a relationship with you. This is about I mean I, I love the framing that this is gonna hurt the mom and pop fuel dealers, mm. right? This helps the mom and pop fuel dealers, oh. right? This helps them move from an oil-dependent, carbon-lock-in, no-future industry to an energy service company, right? To move their labor force and their training away from oil burners and gas burners to electric heat pumps, to weatherization, to diversifying their portfolio. So again, if we think of this in terms of building strong, community-oriented energy sheds, just like we say building strong community focused food sheds, right? Building strong community focused water sheds, right? That's a future when I talk to young people that they can buy into. And they're like, you know what? If the world is going to hell in a handbasket, we're in Vermont, we're doing yeah. something different. Yeah. And I think that's why people are moving here, Frank. I mean, you're right. We, we, have, we have to pay attention to adaptation. We have to pay attention to climate resilience. But do you really think we're building stronger, resilient communities by depending on fossil fuel supplies from distant, far from places? <laughs> because the supply chain shortages and the geopolitics of this stuff is only going to get uglier as the world doubles down on trying to stay on carbon. Yep. Thank you. Yes. Are you done? Sorry, you all got me on my soapbox now. <laughs> I, asked you to, I asked you to get on the soapbox. OK, all right. Um, I have made an argument for years, and I'm wondering if you have research on it, which is, which is what you were, you were saying sure. about the mom and pop propane company, maybe not selling propane, selling, and then maybe not selling propane burners, but, but selling uh, the fuel pumps and or heat pumps and so on. And there's examples of that already. Yeah. Well, uh, what I talk about is, is if you look at what is owned by the tobacco companies, mm. they kind of saw the handwriting on the wall probably 20 years ago. They're not in love with tobacco. They want to sell stuff and get paid money for sure, it. Sure. And they sell all sorts of stuff that is not, they've got capital. Right. And they use their capital to buy stuff to sell that's not tobacco. They diversify. And it seems to me that in theory, the purveyors of fossil fuels ought to be able to do that as well. 
Well, this bill, it, it, I think rightly so, directs this as far up the supply chain as you can get. The point where oil or gas comes into the state, the oil importer, right? The gas importer. That's where you find the most concentration of the industry and the highest profits. <laughs> Right, most concentrated part of the industry and the highest profits, right? And then it's up to way up the supply chain to interact with folks that are down at the distribution and sales to create the energy credits that start to reform the incentives of the system, right? And force the folks up the supply chain right now who have no incentive whatsoever with these kinds of obscene profits to change their business model. They all have advertisements about investment in solar and wind. It's minuscule when you look at their pro at their portfolios, right? Especially in the U.S., this is not the same at, at other uh, energy companies in other parts of the world that are rapidly diversifying their portfolios because they see the writing on the wall. Um, for whatever reason, and I've got mine, um, in the United States, the fossil fuel industry is quite embedded with the political class, and it yeah. continues to be so. So we're, this is all about breaking the chains, all right? breaking the lock-in. Um, this bill does a, one small part of trying to do that. Yeah, it seems to me the main, the main focus of, in a capitalist economy, the main focus of the capitalists is they've got some capital and they want to invest it in stuff that will make them more capital. Right. And That's how it works. I don't think people have an emotional or spiritual or ethical connection that it has to be petroleum that sure. they're selling. Sure. They, they, they could sell pretty much anything that people are going to buy. Well, it's short term, long term, right? Short term quarterly profits, sell petroleum. You're going to make a lot of money. <laughs> long term viability and resilience, it's a different story altogether. I presume that buggy whip manufacturers did not starve. <laughs> There's a great and literature, they, they great literature on, on socio-technical transitions, in fact, yeah. that talked about when we moved, for example, from horse-drawn carriages to automobiles, how much resistance there was, right? <laughs> or when we moved from biofuels to fossil fuels, how much resistance. Mm -hmm. There's always resistance. This is all very predictable in a socio-economic system that has highly concentrated power and profits. Very predictable, right? So that's why I, I frame my testimony in terms of lock-in, right? Because you know I'm always thinking of, like again, coming here year after year after year after year and seeing lock-in persist, and how this bill is one of the first attempts to sort of break it at its source, which is fuel imports into the state of Vermont. Wow. So the other two points I want to make are around carbon intensity and economic development. Can I ask really? Yeah, please. Before we go on. Are you anticipating that the petroleum industries will see increasing stranded costs in the future, and how will those play out? I mean, that's a huge thing in the finance and banking industry. You know, banks are waking up faster than the petroleum industry who finance further oil, oil exploration, further oil development, and are talking this language of stranded assets, right? Um, if the world's nations really get into an emergency mode, and start to, instead of just incentivize demand, but restrict supply, <laughs> you're gonna get into a situation with a lot of stranded assets. And that's gonna trickle down from the very top down to places like Vermont, right? So financial consultants have used this language of traditional standard capitalist financial consultants are talking about stranded assets, right? Um, I, I'm actually giving a talk to a Wall Street firm about their environmental social governance portfolio, one of the biggest investment bankers in the world <laughs> that wants to talk about stranded assets, that wants to talk about carbon lock-in, that wants to learn from this book, which isn't the playbook for staying in the status quo, it's the playbook for pushing against the status quo. And will people who are still using fossil fuels feel that in higher costs? I'm just wondering how, what happens economically to those types of fuel as those industries run into stranded asset problems? Yeah, I mean, the, the cost of fossil fuels and supply side restrictions, right, is only going to raise the price of fossil fuels. And Vermont is being at the very end of the supply chain, we're going to get harmed the most. I mean, it's, it's, it's that simple. How? 
Well, we're not talking about um, restricting fossil fuel jobs in Vermont by getting off of fossil fuels because the fossil fuel jobs are few and far between, right? They're in dealers and you know gas station attendants. They're not fundamentally part of the Vermont economic model or the Vermont economic brand, I should say. Um, states like Wyoming, where my son lives, <laughs> All hell's gonna break loose, right? Because their tax base, their economic model, their job base are based on extractive in an extractive industry model. So they're gonna have the biggest challenge with the stranded asset phenomenon. Wyoming News this weekend. Um, Wyoming News this weekend? In Wyoming News, they were gonna ban uh, electric um, vehicles, yeah. trucks, I think. Yeah. Oh, I saw that. Uh, really? 30, well, it was a yeah, proposal. It's just, yeah, by 30, oh, yeah. by 2035. Right. It's proposals too. They fixed so, the California day, no banning the sale. This is the political playing field, right? So California is banning <laughs> internal combustion engines, Wyoming's banning electric vehicles. <laughs> and, and the rationale was to preserve the fossil fuel industry. Absolutely. Yeah. Meanwhile, have you ever been in the high plains? Not Jackson Hole, but the high plains. It's so windy. <laughs> no, there's a lot of wind. They ought to use yeah. that. Man. Um, this, this, is, this is the biggest part of the lock in phenomenon, right? Is this um, regulatory capture, this political capture. You know, If I were giving this testimony at a Senate committee in, in Wyoming, it would be a very different, yeah. uh, hostile environment because it's, it's the idea of trying to hang on to last little scraps of a, of a dying empire, of a dying era. I mean, we're really at a kind of point, we have been for some time, of a kind of post-industrial transition, a post-oil transition. Um, and the little tiny small state of Vermont has an opportunity to take the lead because in a way it's easiest for us, right? Because we're at the end of the pipe. We're not at the front end of the pipe like Wyoming is. Our politics is different. The fact that this bill didn't pass last year just still keeps me up at night. And the fact that it's it's not more nonpartisan. Also keeps me up at night. It's like, why? How could this possibly saving Vermont money, <laughs> saving energy, helping build more resilient households and homes, getting off of fossil fuels? How could this be a, a partisan issue? But I'm, that's why I'm not in politics. Well, maybe this time, maybe we'll have smoother sailing. <laughs> So carbon intensity, this is another, I think, change right yes. between the bills is to really try to um, put some guardrails on um, the attempt to kind of keep fossil fuel infrastructure in place by quote unquote greening the liquid and gas fuel supplies. Um, I, I'm thrilled, as Senator Bray knows, because we've talked about life cycle analysis and its importance. I'm thrilled that this bill continues to put front and center the idea of life cycle greenhouse gas emissions per unit of energy. Life cycle, as with last year's bill, is the right approach. Um, I have testified on this before, particularly regarding fossil gas expansion in our state and the misplaced focus in the past of the Public Utility Commission on end of burner emissions, right? Um, again, that's old thinking. <laughs> It's dishonest thinking. It doesn't look at the full greenhouse gas um, profile of our fuel source from cradle to grave. Um, a life cycle approach in this bill is further enforced through the language of fuel pathways. So I, I really like that. That's really important, again, to be thinking of pathways, right? This isn't about you know saving a buck tomorrow. This is about saving money over time. And all the analysis that's been done for the state you see the billions of dollars of savings as we hit the global warming solutions targets over time. Um, I understand there's a compromise here because the bill does allow for some near-term flexibility on liquid and gas fuels. Uh, but as this committee knows, um, this is a slippery slope that does relate back to carbon lock-in. So I think we want to be really honest about what, what we're proposing here. Um, this flexibility amounts to kind of industry relief. Uh, and again, an industry with record profits through clean energy credits generated by, and I want to understand this better, by thermal efficiency of existing carbon assets and introduction of so-called renewable natural gas and green hydrogen fuel mix. So let me take those three things on. 
efficiency of existing assets, renewable natural gas, and green hydrogen. Um, while improved efficiency of existing carbon assets, let me be clear, does reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the short run, in my view, it also contributes to further technology to lock in. That's why I frame this as lock in. So you're getting, it's a kind of a one step forward, two steps back proposition. Um, especially, and this is why I made this distinction early on, with new carbon heating infrastructure. New. That would require extraordinarily high fuel prices to incentivize early retirement, right? If I'm a heating consumer in Vermont today and I get a new oil furnace, most efficient, best in brand, best best in class in the market, great. It's more efficient than what I could have bought 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, right? But it locks me in. <laughs> it, for me to retire that um, takes an incredibly high price of oil that we won't, we won't see, incredibly high, and by, I, I mean like $150, $200 a barrel in order to retire those new assets um, within the short term. Um, so, this, this is where I want to be really clear on. Um, the bill explicitly blocks credits from switching from one fossil fuel to another. So that, I think that was in last year's bill and stays in this, so that's great. But it seems like switching from one oil furnace to another is permitted. So that, that's, that's the kind of lock-in that I wish we could avoid. <laughs> But again, I understand the kind of near-term flexibility, but just recognize that you're looking at 20, 25, 30-year lock-in. By replacing that old inefficient boiler with a new efficient boiler, absolutely less greenhouse gas emissions, but over time, the opportunity of that switch, <laughs> the opportunity, like with my brother right now, old oil burner in the basement of the house you just bought, right? The opportunity is not for him to put a new efficient burner in, and say, I got the oil tank, I've got the oil delivery, I've got my local oil supplier. The opportunity now is to go to a high efficiency wood pellet stove, right? Or to go to electric heat pumps. He's got the wood stove now, so he's got that as backup heat, right? He's in a position where he can make that capital decision. And if that capital decision is more oil, but more efficient, yes, he's gonna save money. Yes, he's gonna reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But yes, he's locked in 20, 30 years. Um, question. Um, thank you, Chairman Bright. And this might actually be a question more for you or potentially Ellen. So my understanding, because I also am concerned about that. Yeah. My understanding is a fuel dealer would get a lower amount of credit for making that yes. switch. So ideally, they would be gaming it out and not making that choice unless it was absolutely necessary, like we're talking about a system that the cost, I'm thinking of older buildings that have the, the ducting and the work that right. it might actually, you're trying to balance out, could we put a heat pump in every room kind of thing. Um, so I feel like we do answer you a little do, bit of that. You're ratcheting wondering. carbon intensity over time though. Yes. So you're locking, so you're locking in the business or the homeowner into an oil furnace, right? But over time you're saying, hey, speed this up, retire this thing sooner, yeah. <laughs> right? And so, that's the challenge, right? Yes. That's why it's a one step forward, two steps back. It's like you're making the retirement of that new carbon asset even more difficult in, in the future than the present. The present moment right now, it's the easiest point of retirement. I got an Tell old oil furnace, I wanna get rid of it and, and get off fossil fuels, right? If I lock into a new oil furnace, 10, 20, 30 years down the road when those carbon intensity requirements have dropped a lot, it's it's becoming costly, costlier to retire that asset. So again, it's a trade-off, right? Mm -hmm. And I think I'm, I'm, I'm told that lawmaking is like making sausage, so I understand. Yeah. So mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think the reason I'm comfortable with that trade-off is yeah. because we don't give a lot of, like the weight of making that choice versus actually spending more money as a fuel dealer or someone trying to meet right. your credit requirements, you actually would be more incentivized, you'd get more bang for your buck if you made a deeper investment. Understood. So I, I appreciate that point and I... I and it's, it's helping us achieve like the 2030 targets quicker yes. and on time, but it's making it more difficult to achieve the later targets. So that's the point I'm trying to make. I yeah. hear you. 
So it's, it's, it, that, that needs to be understood. And may, maybe there's trade-offs that happen in other parts of our fossil fuel portfolio and our carbon portfolio that help offset that. Well, and it's also the, uh, the part of the challenge is that that new boiler, by staying on fuel, a fuel source that's yeah. going to, uh, in this ratcheting down carbon intensity environment, could become more expensive over time. Right. It will. So yeah, I mean, I, the, the savings may diminish. So, so, so it's the trade-off for the homeowner as well, and this is maybe part of the education and rollout of this, is because you're sort of saying, hey, short term, you're going to save money. Long term, this doesn't look so good. Yeah. This doesn't look so good. Um, in every oil burner and every home is a upcoming um, replacement cost right. that that homeowner um, has, and to the extent that they could use the money to do the replacement of, the, of what they have to, to replace it with something that is more efficient and less carbon fuel, fuel uh, using, yep. is, um, is that's an expense they already have. Right. And you're not, if you choose to spend it on a different heating source, um, that money has to be spent anyway. Has to be spent anyway. So the yeah. question is long-term long operating costs. Yeah. Upfront capital costs, all these systems have upfront capital costs for low income and moderate income Vermonters, on bill financing, mm -hmm. you know, grants, Inflation Reduction Act money. There's more money available to get off oil than to stay on it, right? And there's lower operating costs over time if you make that capital decision now to get off oil. Um, sorry to interrupt. Secondly, the, uh, we've been reading in the last year or so, or even more, of insurance companies and people that have long-term investments writing off their um, current fossil fuel investments, um, realizing they're going to take a loss on them in the future, and, um, and writing them off now to avoid bigger losses down the road. Right. This is part of the stranded asset. They're also doing a kind of regulatory calculation and seeing that, you know, if we take, for example, our international treaty obligation seriously, there's a regulatory risk of, of early retirement of fossil assets that's going to cost the fossil fuel industry money. Yeah. That's why the banks are particularly interested in this, because they finance all this stuff. <laughs> yeah, so it's the banks and insurance that are driving the ship when it comes to um, uh, fossil industry, fossil fuel industry reform right now. And where are the banks on that? I mean, are they, they're still willing to finance an oil? Um, yes and no. I mean, banks and bankers are some of the most conservative creatures on earth, right? <laughs> um, so there is uh, when there's high high immediate returns which again there is for example has been in the fracking industry right now the whole fracking industry though kind of went underwater until we saw these energy prices bounce back up again and so now some of the short term short term short short termism and bankings alive well again but some of the um, bigger more established longer looking banks won't bite anymore I mean, we're seeing serious financial contraction in terms of new oil and gas exploration in the United States. So that's that 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 the industry is already shifting because the finance is shifting. That's some good news. Yeah, it is good news. But again, um, uh, Vermont needs to sort of you know not not be grounded in the past and their economic development model. Start to be thinking about the future. Uh, we don't want to be the Wyoming of New England. How about that? Thurman <laughs> uh, Could you, uh, I'm sorry, changing the subject. Sure. But could, could you talk a little bit about bio fuels? Yeah, that's my next piece. Oh, okay. Yep, yep. So this flexibility, I, I saw it as sort of three aspects. One is the efficiency aspect of going from oil to oil, right? So we just talked about that. The other piece, right, is to allow credits from renewable natural gas. For example, um, I want to be very clear. <laughs> this also contributes to a kind of socio-technical lock-in because you're sort of saying, let's let's use the existing assets in place, and let's make our fuel stock um, more renewable, um, which is a bit of a misnomer. But 
extending the lifetimes of gas. So it has the same kind of short term, long term, right? Because of extending the infrastructure and reinforcing what I would call greenwashing that is happening around renewable natural gas by arguing for the, so here's, here's the math, right? They're arguing for the avoidance of methane that comes from already, that comes from agriculture and landfills. Instead of saying we need to change agriculture and landfill practices, right, to reduce methane, they're saying this is an economic opportunity to capture methane from an industrialized system, right? And further extend the kind of lifetimes of these so-called stranded assets, right? These carbon assets, pipelines and burners and tanks and et cetera, et cetera. So I see that as it's again, I understand the flexibility that's built in here, but it's another element of further locking in the Vermont system and, and kicking the can down the road in terms of getting off these assets can be even more difficult in the future. Um, the inevitable methane is only inevitable by keeping current farming and waste management practices in place. Renewable natural gas is, is expensive if unsubsidized. <laughs> What's on the market now is subsidized. So it's, again, a kind of handout to try to keep these things going and, and keep us locked in. Subsidized in the form of uh, renewable energy? Subsidized in forms of, of state and federal subsidies for, for biogas digesters, state and federal subsidies for landfill. None of these things happen uh, in the free market. They all happen because of subsidizing these new elements, often in the name of you know, environmental goals. And it's, again, a kind of one step forward, two steps back. Where, where the reform should happen is, why do we have this farming system already? Why do we have this waste management system already? Why are we further encouraging these methane sources in order to green the supply of, of, our, of our gas? And, and the last point is really, really important, which, again, I've made on testimony to the Public Utility Commission. These are negligible supplies. They are tiny compared to the demand. And they never will be big unless we imagine a Vermont landscape that's you know thousands and thousands of dairy farms. Um, I don't see that in our future <laughs> anytime soon. Um, so this is where the greenwashing comes into play because the advertising around renewable natural gas, you'd think it was going to be a big part of the fuel supply, and it never will be. Again, the math doesn't, doesn't add up, doesn't work, unless you see a um, dramatically different future for our, our dairy and, and waste, waste supplies. Um, Senator Watson. So are you, uh, so I, I, I don't necessarily understand uh, a lot of things about farming, uh, but so would it be accurate to say that practices that in farming that allow for the capture of methane uh, would go up against the practices in farming that would be considered like regenerative. Yes. So because by allowing methane to, to generate, you're not capturing the carbon on farm in the first place. Uh, yeah, a farm has a carbon cycle, right? Yeah. So it sequesters carbon and it produces carbon, right? So I'd rather see proposals that are trying to bring that on-farm carbon cycle into balance, right? Versus encouraging an out-of-balance out of system for larger feedstock uh, diets, uh, cattle, cattle cow diets that create the methane to begin with. Mm -hmm. So by controlling diet, by controlling feeding, by going to grazing systems, by building soil, right? These are all things that kind of capture and close the carbon loop on a farm versus let's industrialize our system, let's import feed, right? Let's be locked into a carbon intensive farming system and oh, by the way, sell off the worst, worst culprit, which it is, which are really powerful, strong methane emissions, right? So um, again, I appreciate the carbon intensity ratcheting down over time. I think that's an addition, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's new, that's really important. So it says we're gonna allow for some short-term flexibility for the one or two percent of the gas supply that could potentially be renewable, but it has this kind of um, behavioral effect of greenwashing that whole energy supply, and that's Thank the you. piece that where education is going to be really needed. Thanks, that's helpful. 
Wood. Wood, yeah. And wood chips. So same, same issue around wood, right? Which we have to be thinking about the, the, the carbon cycle of wood, right? It's just, just, so is, is wood net carbon? Is it neutral? Is it positive? It all depends on land management. It all depends on demand, right? If we were to, to go to wood for all of our heating needs in Vermont, right, we would need a fuel stock that's the size of, I did this calculation once, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, and part of upstate New York. <laughs> so it's all about, you know, what, what are you talking about? Are you talking about wood as supplemental heat, as wood as uh, complementary heat to uh, electric heat pumps? I have electric heat pumps in my home, and we have a wood stove that we use for supplemental heat, right? You have that, a wood stove. We have a wood stove. So that's, that, uh, you know, we're trying to create a more balanced heating portfolio. If I were relying just on, on wood heat alone, right, then I'd, I'd probably be out of balance with my, my carbon impact. Ten years ago, I drew comfort from the idea that the distinction between sequestered yes. carbon and non sequestered that wood is part of the natural carbon cycle, burning it just speeds it up. It speeds up, it speeds the cycle, it up yeah. but it doesn't, you know. And then there are people saying, come on, carbon is carbon. <laughs> right, but we have to think about in terms of carbon payback periods, right? So you put in a new, you put in a wood stove, and you know what's the carbon cycle versus a, a properly managed wood lot versus a, a fuel stock that comes from you know high grading fuel stock that comes from really good carbon management plans. So it all depends on just like with farming, it all depends on the carbon management side because it is a renewable resource. And over time, is it in balance or out of balance with the carbon cycle? That's it. That, that could be another whole hour of testimony mm -hmm. if we get into wood. Does this bill address that adequately? Well, I think, I think if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, you sort of leave, you leave wood and you, you do talk about a high efficiency wood and modern. modern wood, and I think all that's important. So I think a lot of this is left to the discretion of the PUC in defining energy credits when it comes to wood, because it's, it's, a, it's, a it's a challenging one because you're talking about the life cycle of a fuel. Uh, creating energy credits around fossil fuels is pretty easy because <laughs> it's not coming back anytime soon. But when we talk about life cycle of a farm or life cycle of a wood fuel source, it's, it, uh, there are assumptions that need to be made. Um, Senator Lloyd, and I'm also just looking at the clock. It's yeah. turning up, so I would just want to not ask so many questions that we don't. Need. Well, I'm almost done, but these these questions are great along the way. Yeah. Great, Senator Lloyd. Thank I was you. worried about not having enough to say, so this is good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, kind of off of the biomass theme. Sure. Um, two questions. So my understanding of the bill and where I feel comfortable with the relationship we've developed in the bill around wood mm -hmm. is that we're not trying, like, biomass to create electricity doesn't make sense. Yeah. But I do think there's some real benefits to biomass for thermal. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the distinction there, because I think people get um, kind of caught up in the weeds right. and don't realize that there can be benefits to the thermal use. And then the second question is, I just want to be really clear about your testimony, which is you're telling us that the biofuels aspect of this bill, mm -hmm. you believe is one step forward, two steps back. So just- I'm saying it contributes to lock-in. Okay. It contributes but, to carbon lock-in. Okay. It, it bolsters the, if it was just the percentage, it doesn't contribute to lock-in much, but the image of green natural gas contributes to lock-in a lot. Okay. <laughs> right, so but, it kind of keeps us in message on fossil fuels longer. But would you say that the dynamics of the bill do move us forward positively? They do, because, okay. because without, without rationing the carbon intensity requirement over time, you, you, it's, it's, it's one step forward, 10 steps back. Mm, right? okay. But by rationing carbon intensity down over time, it's, it's one step forward, two steps back. And it makes, again, just like I was saying with efficiency, improvements it makes the choice to get off mm -hmm. fuel stocks altogether because you're never going to go to 100 percent rng right in vermont you're going to be one two three maybe five percent rng right so you're always going to be blended with fossil fuels mm -hmm. so the choice to get off of that in the future is, is more difficult if you allow that source to be stretched even further mm -hmm. so that's 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 one of the trade-offs yeah i think it is definitely a trade-off absolutely one of the trade-offs but yeah to the biomass piece i'm wondering if you could speak to that, like the it, how you feel about the thermal versus using it for electric generation. Yeah, I mean, for a long time we've known that that, that um, burning wood for for thermal heat and capturing that heat at source, 
right, is the more efficient way to capture those BTUs, those energy units, mm -hmm. versus burning wood for, for electricity. Mm -hmm. Again, depends on feedstock, you know, and the management of the feedstock. Um, and, the, and, and whether that complements a sort of comprehensive energy system or not. You know, I mean, there's a lot of controversy over the net carbon calculation for, for the Burlington McNeil plant, for yes, example, yeah. you know. Um, this building. So he did oh, see, oh, I didn't. Jeez, I never even knew that. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's the capital complex. Yep, yep. Yeah, I mean, Middlebury College is, is trying to be net zero, and, and, you know, they've got some heating heating by wood kinds of things going on. So all of that has to do with the fuel stock, stock cycle. And um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of debate with, amongst the experts uh, on on this issue for sure, for sure. Thank you. It, it, again, my mind points to efficiency weatherization first, right? Again, don't just like switch your furnace out and start burning wood and not pay attention to reducing your energy demand, because <laughs> the reality is is to get to our climate goals worldwide and even as a state. We've got to look at reduction of energy demand, significant reduction of energy demands, you know, below 50%. Yeah, and I think what I hear most from constituents is the leaning on wood because it is something that um, is uh, proofed from major catastrophes. So if the power grid goes out, um, you're able to heat your home still. Yep. So I do see our constituents having some genuine and I think sure, sure. justified fears about moving away from wood um, because they're worried about the system and the functionality of it in yep. situations just, just that are hard. So just conversation with my wife. Because yeah. <laughs> so. we lost power for two days in Ferrisburg and we had a wood stove mm -hmm. and we had talked about rigging our electric system to hook up a gas powered electric generator, right? Mm -hmm. So we were like, what do we need? We need wood. We need heat. That's all we need, right? Yeah. Water, okay. You know, we have a farm, so we stocked up on water before the power went out. And it was getting close to whether we we're going to have to go down the river or not yes, and start scooping yes. buckets. But yeah. <laughs> might have called up my neighbor to help me. But <laughs> um, but that those are the kinds of trade offs, yeah. Mm, thank for you. For sure. Uh, I'm actually hold my question sure. for 15 minutes. So let me just wrap up really briefly. Um, the third one was green hydrogen, which is kind of measured offhand in here. I, I'll just give you my quick opinion on this. This is also a kind of industry lock-in. It's investing energy to make energy to make energy. Um, the math on green hydrogen is kind of points to one of the biggest fairy tales of all in the energy system right now. Um, most hydrogen at scale currently and into the near future, 20, 25, 30 years out, is brown hydrogen, where we burn fossil fuels to make hydrogen. <laughs> um, and using valuable assets like wind and solar to make liquid fuels when we should be electrifying our loads um, is, again, a, there's lots of catch-22s built in there. So it's an attempt to stay locked, on to, locked into a kind of liquid fuel source. Um, um, we're having debates about this at UVM right now, which is involved in a green hydrogen research project, which, um, again, if you take the life cycle approach, which this bill does, if you take a more comprehensive approach to reforming our energy system, um, green hydrogen, the amount of credits that are going to be generated in green hydrogen in Vermont are going to be pretty darn negligible <laughs> in the near future, so maybe it's a, mm. belongs in there, but I don't know. Um, I don't know what the discussion was about including that, besides just keeping the all of the above mentality. Yeah, I think it's right. Sort of, but, but you know, it's my comfort around the inclusion of it is that the, the analysis by the technical advisory group, because it is a full pathway, a kind of grave analysis, yep. will, I hope, prevent the system from being, you know, uh, abused in a way like that. Yeah, yeah. We'll see the full carbon costs in that fuel and it'll be reflected in the carbon intensity yes. of it on its scale. Yeah, it all, it, it all depends on how it's made. And it has, right now, it has huge energy intensity. And so the green argument is we'll use green energy to make the hydrogen, right? But the green energy itself, we're burning fossil fuels to make the green energy. So we've got lots of catch 22s built into our system as we make this transition. How about, have you seen much in the way of uh, hydrogen produced 
with renewable energy, so wind or solar power. You know, it's it fluctuates. For sure. Some people said you know you can have a battery to store that power and even things out, or maybe you generate uh, green hydrogen and then that's your way of storing that. Uh, later on, bring it to a fuel cell to generate lights. I mean, there's some arguments we made around around fuel storage. You know, we waste a lot of energy because we have to keep the lights on all the time. So rather than turning things on or off all the time and wasting energy, you take the excess energy and pump water uphill for for our, so the hydro, or do you use it to make green hydro hydrogen? Do you make a fuel stock that is basically like a battery? So when you treat green hydrogen like a battery, you know you see more benefits than just treating as a source that we have to use all the time. I mean, we're seeing some nations like Iceland, I'm, I'm an adjunct professor of Iceland in part because of, of all my energy work, and they're doing some really extraordinary things in Iceland around trying to be net zero, and green, green hydrogen is part of the formula there, but Iceland's a different creature. I mean, they just poke a hole in the ground and they've got heat, yeah. so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if we had some volcanoes in Vermont, maybe we get all our get all get all our uh, kindergartners to make uh, paper mache volcanoes. In the <laughs> yeah, she could. Yeah. <laughs> my nephew, my nephew just made one yesterday. So the last point I want to make is just just to sort of emphasize the economic development dimensions of this, which again the bill doesn't shout about, but. It's important to keep in mind that this puts incentives for fuel dealers, we talked about this earlier, to diversify and create new income streams, right? It's pretty easy to get set in our ways. I do it all the time, right? But if you're incentivized to diversify and create new income streams, that can only be good for Vermont's future. Shifting a core business model away from I'm a oil supplier to I'm an energy service company. And again, we've seen some of the energy service companies do this already. Um, I was, I've been on statewide councils where they were at the table and talking about, yeah, our future is not oil, our future is energy service. Um, there will be generating the credits that fuel importers need, right? And are incentivized to innovate, cut costs, build on current consumer relationships. So again, this is that sort of we know there's going to be huge cost savings that are going to be passed on to the consumer. The argument is going to be made there's going to be extra costs that are passed on to consumers. But I see this as all of this kind of offsetting each other. And, and, and the math of the studies that use the input output models show just that, that the net is savings. And the challenge is the timing of when those savings are realized when yes. they invest and that, that's why things like on-bill financing, low-interest loans are huge, right? Because if you can spread that cost out over time, you'll, you'll see those savings. Uh, we've historically, I don't need to remind you all, struggled with incentivizing demand for weatherization and electrification. But this bill has elements of what I would call a supply push. A supply push from the dealers, right? That is aligned with not keeping customers on oil and gas. This is huge, right? Um, this changes the landscape from everything from advertising to workforce attraction to a full service model of maintenance and upkeep that benefits Vermont communities, you know. Um, I mean, I've got one of those solar trackers at my house and I have a contract to service it over 10 years, right? So it's not a one-shot deal. There are service income that's built into all these new energy systems. Um, immediate use, as I've already said, of new federal dollars with multiplier effects on reducing energy burdens, developing a competitive internal workforce. I'm tired of subsidizing workforces elsewhere and keeping and recycling those energy dollars locally. Um, again, along the lines of economic development, there's potential for more comprehensive approaches, I think, that avoid or reduce um, a rebound effect. Sometimes we become more efficient and means more energy use. Mm -hmm. But um, again, Vermonters don't wake up and say, I wish I could spend more money on heating my home. Um, so there's, there's a kind of net savings um, that in all the studies that I've seen show to, at the household level, that's really important to keep track of as economic development. And I'll just make these final two points. There's potential for new economies of scale to emerge, um, especially at district heating scales or in community-owned systems. So I like that the bill sort of 
signals that in terms of credits, right? Because there's huge efficiencies and economies of scales that can be had by, by district heating, especially in technologies like geothermal. Um, and I almost want to give kind of bonus points for that, but I think it will be captured in the heating energy credits. Um, and this is ultimately, as I said before, about decentralizing the heat sector. It's about um, empowering the energy consumer. And it's thinking more like an energy shed that um, kind of whether we do this by design or by disaster, we're gonna be re relocalizing our energy system. So why not capture more of the benefits and the costs today instead of you know forced to do it in the future? Ooh, that was a beautiful line. By design or by disaster? That, that was like, <laughs> <laughs> and people, sorry, you gotta be excited. But in, by disaster will hurt the most vulnerable people. Again, I, I don't wanna be back here in a couple of years for the yeah. same old story about, hey, it's another cold winter and Vermonters are stuck on oil and we're taking the subsidies and, you know? Yeah. That's by disaster, yeah. right? Sort of following the waxing and waning of oil prices is by disaster before, instead of sort of taking those, the future into our own hands. That's why I can't oh. believe this is not a nonpartisan approach because it helps, helps the average Vermonter. Um, there are people who are concerned about how this will build out, what the sure. cost implications will be, and they are suggesting we should slow down and do studies for another year. Oh my god. And, um, Sorry, that's on the record. Right here, <laughs> <laughs> I think currently there's a tenth study underway. Okay. Um, this so, is part of the Groundhog Day because I've seen these studies every year I come and testify about the studies and it's just kicking the can down the road. Mm -hmm. How many more studies? There's this great cartoon of this person wandering through the desert, right? And everything's dry and nothing's growing. And I think they've got an Uncle Sam hat on and they're like, one more study, right? <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I feel like. That's the kind of lock in that we're in on the one more study mentality. Sorry to interrupt you. you no, know, it's just, you know, so um, you no know, one has a, even in the current system, there's no certainty. Absolute sure. Certainty. Absolutely. So the idea that, um, building a new program, acknowledging that it has some uncertainty in it, for some people, that, well, that I don't even want to start. Right. But yes. it, it ignores the fact that there's uncertainty in staying right where we are. And it's, uh, but sure. it's a mindset that is challenging. I mean, it's a human nature mindset. That's why I said cultural is also part of the lock-in, right? It's, it's, a, it's an important part to recognize that there is a, uh, it's scary to do something new and different and to sort of say, but I've always done it this way. And, and a lot of that's in our workforce too, right? I've always done it this way. Um, so um, my, my, the, the plumber who, who built our heating system um, was he, he, HVAC guy. He was the first, it was the first electric heat pump he did. You know, he was like, you sure you want me to do this? And I'm like, absolutely, let's do this. You know, so um, he made some mistakes and we figured it out. Um, but now he's doing them left and right. Yes. This was like four years ago. Yes. Yeah. It's like his quarter was business now. <laughs> A local fuel dealer uh, around me, it's stop delivering fuel and just a service. Yeah, yeah. And they are straight up is all yeah. so I mean I think when we see resistance to a bill like this the question to ask right away is are you thinking short term or long term mm. right I mean are you thinking in terms of your future or your children's future I mean I know we do that all the time the next election hmm. that's, I mean that's that's the other part of the groundhog day is the two year political cycle in, in our state you know um, but boy but the, the context is different now than in past testimony I've given around climate and energy legislation is the Global Warming Solutions Act. Yeah. We have man, we're, not, we're out of gold land where we have goals. And if we make them great, if we don't, eh, at least we tried. We're in the mandate land now. And um, you all passed that into law. I, I, <laughs> I suppose you could unpass it, but. Yeah, that, but you know, my, Shorthanded caucus there is it's required. It's required. The question is how. Right. Uh, right. So you're now doing the hard work and the uncertain work of how, right? How do we do this? And and this is given that thermal heat is the second biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions in, in Vermont, 
given that we have a legacy of old housing stock, given that we're most dependent on fuel oil amongst all of our New England neighbors, right? Why not start with this approach? I mean, it's a, it's an, again, from the outside looking in, it's a, it's a no-brainer. Um, well, with that, we're wrapping up right at noon. So thank you very much for coming in. Thanks for all the questions. It was a great conversation. Uh,